Iran. I know Iran. Persia. It's my friends at Press TV. Okay. So, uh, Mrs. Deborah, thank you for having us. My pleasure. So, in Iran, uh, you've, you've probably heard and seen these signs of this uh, attack, which was um, recorded against a building of a sort of a military industrial complex uh, of the Iranian Ministry of Defense of Islamabad. And who do you think is behind this attack? Why was it uh, carried out? Well, Israel has been carrying on uh, attacks on the uh, Iranian military infrastructure for many years, as has the United States. I'll remind you about the uh, murder during the last president's administration of uh, General Soleimani. <clears throat> um, variety of uh, military targets that uh, Israel and the United States have claimed were connected to some uh, nuclear weapons program or to uh, uh, rocket uh, programs or other military industrial uh, activity have been targeted over the years. So Israel, uh, the United States with Israel as a nation basically is one uh, suspect that uh, has to be considered. There were also some comments made by one of the advisors to uh, Vladimir Zelensky that uh, sounded very much like uh, they might have had a hand in it. But again, I don't think Ukraine is going to be projecting power into the Middle East without not just the permission of the United States, but, you know, sort of a push and maybe a, a lift from the United States. So, uh, you know, there are other powers in the area, uh, Turkey um, and, uh, you know, Iraq and some, you know, some contradictions there uh, and uh, Egypt also. But the most likely suspects would be uh, Israel, uh, the United States, and then, you know, trying to parse exactly what that statement out of uh, Kiev was about. What do you think about one of the uh, one of the theories, which says, like you mentioned already, Israel uh, this way is supporting Ukraine without sending weapons uh, to Kiev. What do you think of it? Well. You know, it's hard to distinguish uh, Israel from the United States in terms of policy. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, uh, Israel has a great deal of influence uh, over the Congress. Uh, this, the you know, domestic uh, organization, AIPAC, uh, is very uh, closely connected to Israel and, uh, you know, is more or less a... Uh, uh, that provides diktat to members of Congress. If you ask some of them, uh, Cynthia McKinney, Dennis Kucinich, you know, they got instructions, and, and when they refused to accept the instructions from AIPAC, uh, they found themselves out of Congress. Um, but you also have to consider um, the, uh, the hand of Kiev in this particular case, and again, as an agent of the United States, because there's been some positioning uh, where they're attempting to get Israel to, keep, to provide some weapons, Iron Dome, for example, uh, that Israel has at least publicly been reluctant to do. Um, we've been watching how the manipulation along those lines of the U.S. government and some of the European governments by some of the forces assembled around Kiev. I mean, I don't give Kiev actual agency here. You know, Kiev is an agent uh, of uh, NATO, the U.S., whatever. Uh, but there's a, you know, a distinction in terms of identity where this player has got this role and that player has got that role. And so they may well have a hand in it. And, and, and that would be over negotiating, basically, for some weapon systems. If Tehran decides it was uh, a key for Kiev's participation, how could uh, Iran respond to, to Ukraine? Well... You know, there's a sort of a uh, developing relationship, not just between Iran and Russia and Iran and China, and also between Russia and China, but many of the other, uh, you know, members of the world community, first those who have been sanctioned and banned and, and uh, you know, basically attacked by the U.S., uh, over the past years, and also others who are just victims of colonialism uh, and or... Would you please make a little step to your right? You 
Because you just... I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry. Anyway, the trade is good. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll take that one again? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. No, we, uh, ask the question again, if so, you will. Uh, if, if Tehran decides Kyiv was a part of this attack, how could, uh, how could Iran respond to... Okay. To, to Ukraine. Right, well, first, obviously, Iran has the absolute right to respond in any way it sees fit as a sovereign nation. And, and it has some wherewithal to do that. It has some missiles that I don't know if they can reach, but they probably can. They've got some intermediate range missiles and they're not so far away from Ukraine. Um, I think, though, that I'm watching the developing relationship between Iran, Russia, China, that the response would be somewhat coordinated. Iran is coordinating military activity, I assume, with Russia in Syria, for example, and around Syria. Um, and uh, there have been joint exercises between Russia, China, and South Africa, and now they're saying also with Iran. And so the response would be something that would be part of a whole cloth. That's my guesstimate. And I think that would be the wisest course to follow, obviously. Okay, uh, according to some sources, the attack was carried out by Israel with the support of the United States and Kurdish group. What do you think of Kurdish groups? Yeah. Be also a part of this. Uh... Yeah, there, you have Kur some Kurdish groups that are on the CIA's payroll. Uh, you also have Kurdish groups that are on the Pentagon's payroll, and we've seen actual battles, military clashes between those two. Uh, during the Obama administration and the beginning of the Trump administration. Uh, certainly, uh, it is entirely possible, and I would say likely, that uh, some of the uh, military activity directed at Iran uh, comes out of uh, some of the Kurdish paramilitary groups that the U.S. backs, and that they operate in conjunction with the U.S. and some of the uh, and Turkey and some of the others, uh, Saudi Arabia as well. Officials in Israel and the United States are not ruling out a military confrontation with Iran. How do you think Iran can respond to the attack and could a war break out? Uh, who will be participating in this and how dangerous would it be? Well, I'll say up front, it's very dangerous already. Um, you have to look at the, uh, the activity uh, that was taking place, military activity that was taking place in advance of particularly both of the last two world wars. Um, people conceive of these almost as like an all-star game, you know, where everyone uh, has their, uh, you know, their, their all-stars on one team. So you have the, like the, the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance, for example, at, at the beginning of World War I that they go into battle together and that's how they fight. It isn't that way at all. There are these uh, various contradictions that exist between countries that are adjacent to or otherwise, you know, proximate to each other in the marketplace or in the colonies or whatever. And you have several of these contradictions that bl blossom into conflict or, or military conflict. Um, and then suddenly, uh, there's an alignment of forces because this group sees that they have a common interest uh, against the other group, and, and that, at that point in time, you end up with these alliances on the battlefield. You know, a war between, uh, you know, uh, Russia and Ukraine with NATO backing Ukraine, actually a government installed by NATO, so it's not really Ukraine, um, and, and then, say, a war going on uh, with Iran, and uh, in Israel, maybe Turkey, maybe Saudi Arabia, uh, and then maybe Iraq throws in. Um, you know, what happens with India in this case? What happens with South Africa in this case? What happens with, you know, look at the uh, Gold Coast, look at all of the uh, people, as you take rainbows out from the center of these conflicts, what will happen in Ch with China and Japan and Korea? All these things are going to end up it looks like they're moving towards an actual global conflict that will involve a number of these hotspots. And so a war with Iran would fall into the, you know, this larger construct. Um, and so now you're talking about who would be involved on what sides. Well, we've seen sort of the uh, dress rehearsal 
like they had in Europe before uh, each of the world wars, like in Spain, for example, before World War II, a dress rehearsal in Syria, where you have a U.S.-backed, uh, you know, terrorist, uh, you know, attack, basically, uh, aiming to do what they did in Libya, which is to be allowed to directly conduct an air war against the uh, government's troops and forces. Uh, that was thwarted by Russia and China at the United Nations, and the U.S. honored that. They didn't abandon the U.N. and just do the war from the air. Um, and so you've had a dress rehearsal with, between Turkey, NATO ally, United States, uh, some Iraqis, some Kurds, and Russians with the Syrians going on now for 11 years. between Israel and Palestine deteriorated again and U.S. Secretary of State Blinken flew to Israel and met with the leaders of both countries. What do you think is the reason for this aggravation of relations? Maybe this is one of the ways to put pressure on Iran by Israel or and will the U.S. help resolve this conflict? It, Israel, quote-unquote, uh, is a... Uh, Israel is a European settler colony in Palestine that has been eating Palestine with the assistance of the U.S. and Europe since the late 1940s. And there is very little left of Palestine in terms of real estate. There's certainly very little left in terms of national sovereignty. And um, it seems what's happened with the government that's now, we've had one conservative government after another, more and more right wing, and uh, there, there, there's no one putting a leash on them at all. The United States has allowed them to bomb <laughs> any country in the world that did any of the individual acts that have been committed by the Israeli government against just Gaza uh, would have produced the most outrageous screaming and hollering at the United Nations Security Council, at a military response, a global boycott, uh, all kinds of punishments saying that this is not something that can be tolerated. You know, the, the Palestinians are being starved today and bombed tomorrow and starved again, and this has been going on now for 65, 70 years. And the U.S. isn't just tolerating it. The U.S. is funding it, arming it, and training it, and supporting it globally. Look at the votes on, uh, for example, the condemnation of Nazism at the United Nations, on Cuba's sanctions, on almost any issue where the United States stands alone, there are usually three or four countries standing with the United States. Israel, always, okay? On, on apartheid, for example, condemning apartheid, Israel votes with the United States saying, no, we don't condemn apartheid. And uh, then Palau, Marshall Island, you know, these that have a population of like six people and a goat. That's the U.S. alliance. Israel is a U.S. Uh, uh, protectorate, certainly. Maybe it has an ambiguous relationship in that there are some centers of power situated there that reach into Washington, but it is basically a U.S. puppet. Okay. Turkey uh, wants to involve Iran in the negotiation process in Syria, which was organized by Russia, according to analysts. This will be useful both for Syria and for relations between Turkey and Iran since it, this way the countries can find a common language on issues in which they disagree as well as to stabilize the situation in the region. Do you think uh, this is a useful initiative? Will Syria and Turkey be able to sign a peace, uh, peace agreement on this treaty? I mean, it's a very useful initiative. Is it going to be allowed to come to fruition is really the thing that's on the, you know, it's, it's, it's an open question. Um, Turkey, of course, benefits from stability in the region. We saw when the uh, push back and forth that was happening in, in, uh, over the last 15 years or so, now since, essentially since 2011 with the war in Syria, as uh, Turkey had a couple confrontations with Russia, shot a plane or two down out of the sky. These different things happened. 
Russians who had been going to Turkey and spending a lot of money on vacation and tourism and stuff stopped. That had a major impact on Turkey's economy. You know, the United States and Europe didn't do anything to compensate Turkey. Also, you know, Turkey has had a long history, you go back to the Ottoman Empire, as being a part of Europe, and it's physically a part of the European continent. But in the same way that uh, Western Europe and quote-unquote Europe proper uh, looks down on uh, the Orthodox uh, community in the east of Europe and Slavs, they look at Turkey as being Asiatic and not even Christian. And so they have not been allowed to join the EU as a proper member, and their status within the uh, uh, within NATO is also more or less just been as a base where they could put forward based weapons against Russia. So they understand this, and they understand also that n number one, you know, this is this is a great uh, nation that was part of an empire historically. It's the crossroads between Asia and Europe. Uh, it's a very important geostrategic uh, location. Uh, and, and on top of all of that, uh, they are poised to do a whole hell of a lot of business with everybody because of where they are. And for that, they need stability. And I see Erdogan trying to navigate his way towards that. And that'll be the forward motion for relations with Syria if it's allowed to happen. Middle East countries begin <clears throat> to try to independently resolve their conflicts either without intermediaries or through intermediaries, the countries in the Middle East or the Persian Gulf. What do you think, how does the U.S. feel about the fact that uh, they have ceased to be a regulator in the Middle East, although diplomats continue to visit Middle Eastern countries, but their role in the region has sharply decreased? Well, the people in the Middle East have endured the U.S. presence, you know, really it, it, very strongly uh, in the post-war period, post-1945, but even going back to the 20s and 30s, um, particularly since 1990, 1991, with the U.S. invasion of Iraq the first time. Um, and and in, in Iran, as a matter of fact, you have a history with the coup going back in 1953, and then the uh, sanctions regime and the attempted counter-revolution that went on since 1979. Um, Afghanistan, the war that began in 1979 there, the, the United States began to basically as a, a frontal attack on the Soviet Union. Um, and so the people there, they've seen the Americans come, take everything that wasn't nailed down, kill as many people as they could reach with their weapons at the time, um, and then leave with the gold and, and whatever the hell else they could carry away. This is not behavior that develops a constituency on the ground going forward. Um, the, the, again, the... I'll wait on this. This is not the behavior that uh, develops the... Right. Of, uh, and, so, and so, again, the, the geography here is very important, too, to, to you know, looking at w what's going to develop. You see the development of the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, the, uh, the uh, Shanghai Cooperative Organization and other multilateral organizations with the development of a, a Eurasian economy uh, that reaches from, say, from uh, even Japan, but from Korea uh, to Africa. Um, a lot, of, you know, the Middle East is right there. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the, you know, it's a nexus point between, say, the factories of China and the markets of Europe, and vice versa. And so, you know, the United States may still be able to project military power into the region, and the United States may do everything it can to maintain its former hegemony over, you know, all of these areas, but. I think it's spent its influence in Iraq. I think it's spent its influence if it had any in Syria. I think it's spent its influence in, in, in a, a number of the other countries. And we're even seeing in the relations with Saudi Arabia, which was like the primary protectorate there, uh, Saudis have refused to bail out the Biden administration after what they did with Russia and what they've done with OPEC with, the, with oil and natural gas. So you're seeing, I think, 
real prospects there for uh, an independent and uh, self-interested policy to start coming out of the nations of the Middle East. Couple more questions. Would you believe Turkish President Erdogan said that Turkey will not support Sweden's application to join uh, NATO. Yes. This happened uh, after several protests in Sweden uh, during which the Koran was burned out and the uh, effigy of Erdogan was hung. If, in your opinion, will Turkey be able to achieve its goal? Will Sweden deport, Sweden deport those whom Turkey demands? Or will Sweden uh, abandon the idea of joining NATO? Or will the NATO countries, in particular the United States, put pressure on Turkey and force it to allow Sweden to join the alliance? Well, okay. I mean, there's uh, some multifaceted uh, situation here. Uh, first of all, you have to consider whether or not, <clears throat> I mean, look, the U.S. goal is to take down the Russian state and seize control of the natural resources. That's been a, that's probably been the longest running project in human history with the largest budget. Going back at least to 1917, the military budgets in the United States, certainly since 1945, had that as a primary goal. Um, and so configurations like NATO and the other uh, like sort of bilateral relationships that exist in between the United States, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, you know, all of these uh, countries, the U.S. Have, has military relations with them. The U.S. has AFRICOM, for example, in Africa, and they're not members of NATO. So, you know, membership in NATO is not necessary for a nation to be a part of a coordinate military strategy against Russia. And so, so, in other words, whether they go in or not matters, but not a whole lot. They're, they can still perform the same role whether they're members of NATO or not. Now, uh, the, the value of them being in NATO is there apparently, and Erdogan has some chips he can play with because the, the, anyone can veto the entry of, of new members. And he's been playing that. And he's been using it as a negotiating lever. Um, and he's been you know, successful in negotiating some concessions for Turkey. And one of the things he's trying to do is leverage Turkey into the EU. I mean, that's still a problem. They, they say we, gave, we give up, but there are some people that will make a lot of money in Turkey if that happens. And they have his ear, I'm sure. He may well be one of them, for all I know. So. Um, they're playing that game. The United States may have some reason that, that, that I don't see where it's imperative that NATO be expanded to include these countries, uh, in which case there will be a tremendous amount of pressure and or a willingness to make concessions to have this happen. If they really need it to continue their policy against Russia, they're going to find a way of achieving it. That's my opinion. I mean, we'll see, but that's what I think. Um, an additional complication is the cultural activity, whatever, the right wing, whoever's responsible for this anti-Muslim uh, activity inside of Sweden, they have their own agenda. And that's a fly in the ointment. We're seeing that this is the same thing we saw with uh, Charlie Hebdo in France. And, you know, just there's... Uh, a long history and strain of racism and religious chauvinism, nationalism that's hostile to the rest of the world that resides in Europe. I mean, look at the history of Europe as a, you know, for, for that re reference. Um, and so, you know, whether this is just some uh, intrinsic nativism that got out of hand or there's some policy, you know, that's being driven by some sector of the society in Sweden, he, this is something else that's going to have to be factored. Would Erdogan have the political space for a rapprochement with Sweden after what's happened? That's another question. It may be that he's willing to say, okay, we we've, we've fixed this, and his own people will turn around and say, that, that, that's blasphemy. You, there's no way we can give you that space. You're out. So it's going to be interesting watching them work around this. A little, really small step to you right now. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Sorry I was leaning, I know. 
So Erdogan is running the president again, and he has no yeah. in May. Uh, for, example, for instance, John Bolton wants to exclude Turkey from NATO if Erdogan remains in power. Is that possible? Uh, and how does Erdogan's foreign policy affect his chances of re-election? Well, in terms of John Bolton, you know, he also thinks that uh, Juan Guaido should be president of Venezuela. Very few people in the world pay any attention to what he's saying other than for amusement. Um, in terms of power, he has none. Uh, I don't know who he thinks he speaks for uh, or who's putting him out there to say some of the things that he's saying. But if I were Erdogan, I would focus on what I want to do and pay no attention whatsoever to John Bolton. At the same time, there is a conflict between, a possibility of conflict between Greece and Turkey, two yes. major countries. A video of a Greek coast guard boat firing at a Turkish coast guard boat in the Aegean Sea has surfaced at the beginning of the year. At the same time, the leaders of the countries exchange threats. Why do the parties uh, aggravate the situation and fail to reach an agreement? Can a war break out, break out between two NATO countries and why is it uh, so dangerous? Now, this is one of those contradictions that I was talking about before that exists, you know, in the, at the lower level, like the smaller. Uh, this is this is an ancient one. <laughs> you know, Turkey and, and Greece have been at it, you know, certainly for the entire modern period. But, you know, it goes back even. You've got, you know, the it's the home of Orthodox Christianity on the one hand um, and of Islam on the other, Turkey alone. I mean, Constantinople was, you know, is in Turkey, Istanbul. That was the Eastern Church's capital. Um, and, and Greece has sort of succeeded to that. Those two civilizations have been at each other's throats for a very long time. One stop forward, yeah, it's again. That's okay, it's okay. Those two civilizations, those two civilizations have been at each other's throats for a long time. Um, there are, for years, uh, you know, near uh, engagements between uh, airplanes of the air forces of the two, um, you know, where they have weapons hot and almost shoot each other down on a regular. Also, their navies, they have, uh, you know, on, on the uh, water of various uh, near-miss conflicts. Um, they've fought in, uh, you know, over some of the islands. If you take a look at, like, Cyprus and other places, you know, it's half Turkish and half Greek and whatever. There's a whole history behind that. Um, and, and they also have some things in common, though, because they're both outliers uh, in the uh, EU. I mean, Turkey's a complete outlier. They're not even allowed to be a member. But if you'll remember back to the time of, uh, of Cyprus and others with Syriza, you know, Greece was on its knees uh, because of the policy that was being made in uh, Brussels and in uh, Berlin. Uh, for the finances that if, uh, for the EU that affected uh, Greece very negatively. Um, and, and both of them are sort of exploited pretty heavily in the uh, European economic uh, situation. And, and both of them are also, you know, they're kind of dissed in the, in the geopolitical situation too. They, they are essentially places for bases for NATO um, and not exactly uh, sitting at the command table making policy. So their objective condition really should militate towards some sort of alliance, but they have a long history of uh, conflict. The last one. Yeah. Uh, there are so many attempts to resolve the situation in the Middle East, but someone is just starting it again, throwing matches into the faded fire. Why do you think destabilize the Middle East again? Who gets benefits uh, if there are constant conflicts in the region and no, no, no peace? Well, the people who were there benefit from stability. You can trade, you can grow c crops, uh, you can drill for oil, uh, you can manufacture goods without worrying about these things being blown up or burned or stolen or whatever. The people in the area, the, these nations themselves, all, all would benefit from peace. There are outside interests who are able to dominate this area when there's chaos. And when you create chaos 
and you can be an outside party offering protection to one of the factions that are facing chaos, you can grab a captive ally on the ground to express your will across the area. So the parties that really are creating the chaos, I would say the primary party is the United States. It's the one that's the furthest away from the region that has its hands deepest into the pocket of the region and has historically had it even deeper and is now facing, you know, every time it gets stable over there, the role of the United States diminishes. And so, you know, we're looking at, with stability, the Belt and Road Initiative and others where you're going to see China, Russia, and, and everyone along that path benefiting each other and there's really nothing for the United States there except the rest of the world is prosperous maybe we can do some trade with them but that's not how they do business here so what they like to do is slash and burn and go in and pick up the pieces and that's who will be responsible Mr. Dubois, thank you so much.